Well, welcome to the Hero Show, starring the illustrious John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How are you That's doing me. today, John? Yeah. How are you doing today, bro- buddy? Oh, I'm great. How are you doing? Um, I'm grooving, man. I'm ready to rock and roll. We got a great show uh, coming up today. Uh, but before we do that, we have a couple of comments on previous shows, don't we? Yeah, we had a couple things come into the comment bin, and we appreciate that. We Let's sure do. That. And a uh, uh, question from Ben, if we have Ayn Rand on our heroes list, uh, on our to-do list. And I think we can say uh, definitely that Ayn Rand is going to be featured on one of our hero shows at some point. Without oh, a for doubt. Sure. Yeah, without a doubt. Ben, so so don't you know? Don't worry, we're definitely going to get time ran. And Kelsey commented that the jingle is is delightful. Yeah, and I, and I, and I, uh, thank you, Kelsey. And I agree. I give all props to John Hersey for finding that uh, piece, that delightful piece of music somewhere. Yeah, it's it, it's excellent. I, I I agree. Well, there's a little bit of backstory there. I don't get all the credit because you know you brought up John Philip Sousa, and I absolutely love that idea. You know, unfortunately, I don't know how many Sousa recordings we can we can use without getting uh, sued for some sort of licensing breach. But uh, but I found that thing on on your recommendation, on your suggestion. I just sort of searched for stuff that sounded like Sousa, and we came up with that. And and on that note, I should also mention that uh, Andrew is the genius behind the idea for our logo as well. See uh, Washington there crossing the Delaware. That was, that was your idea, Andrew. <laughs> well, thank you at Washington. You know, we, um, we discussed Ben Franklin a, a few weeks ago, and I think we agreed that uh, given Franklin's extraordinary accomplishments, he is the greatest American uh, uh, of history. But George Washington was always my favorite hero. And, you know, he's, you know, got to point out you know, objectively that he was a slave owner, which obviously is bad, but we don't honor him for that. We honor him for the extraordinary accomplishments in, in support of liberty, not slavery, that Washington reached. So, so having George Washington on the logo to me is, uh, you know, for the hero show is perfect. Absolutely. Do you guys want to see an episode on Washington? Let us, let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear what else you guys are interested in seeing. And if you don't want, if you don't want George Washington on the hero show, you better check your premises. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. Get yeah, out no, of here. No, we still love you, but just, you might want to rethink that, you know, because <laughs> I think George Washington is, is, is uh, gets, gets more credit uh, as more responsible for the founding of the American Republic than, than any other single, single individual. Yeah. You know, we ought to think about when we can do him, you know, obviously recently, uh, th- there was a statue of his defaced in Chicago, and yeah. uh, it's just yeah. absolutely that's ridiculous. Hor- that's people, horrifying. Yeah, it's that's horrifying. That, that, ignorance of history, really. People latch on to a few details, and they really don't know his incredible achievements and and how he set the stage for all the uh, improvements that were to come. So, right, right, absolutely. And you know, I'm, uh, my background's in philosophy, which of course is is perfect for the discussion today on on Aristotle. But so I'm just a dilettante in history, but you know, it's good to have friends. And you know, one of my friends is, is Brad Thompson, who's an expert, you know, PhD in American history and expert on the revolutionary period, uh, written, you know, a well-regarded book on John Adams, his new book on you know, the, the mind of the American revolution. I, I have a copy, I haven't read it yet, but I'm sure you know, I've heard from people I respect, it's brilliant, and I'm not surprised. Anyway, I asked Brad a couple of years ago about Washington. I, I said, you know, I asked him, would, would the war of independence, could it be won without Washington's leadership? And he said, no. And I said, well, could, could Madison and Hamilton and those guys have gotten the constitutional convention off the ground if they weren't able to, to convince Washington to preside over it? And he said, no. I said, I said well, the, would, the, would the Constitution have been ratified except on the tacit understanding that Washington would serve as the first president? You know, and, and Dr. Thompson said, no. So I, I think that my, my limited knowledge of American history, I think that's all true. So I'm, I think you can make a case that Washington, more than anybody else, is, is uh, more than anybody else is responsible for the founding of the American Republic. So, yeah, we definitely got to do we definitely got to do uh, George Washington. Yeah, we ought to have. 
uh, Dr. Thompson on. Actually, I, it's funny. I just emailed him yesterday to talk to him about potentially coming on the other podcast that I do, which you guys haven't seen. It's called Philosophy for Flourishing, also from the Objective Standard Institute. You got to check that out. But I'm hoping to have Dr. Thompson on that show in the near future as well. But uh, we'll, we'll just have to to bring him on both. He's just so knowledgeable. He's just yeah, a wealth it, of- it, all things in time, right? If we're going to do John Adams, certainly we need, we, we did John Quincy Adams. If we're going to do John Adams, we certainly need uh, to have Dr. Thompson and, and maybe uh, you know, we got in George Washington as well. But um, so let's dive into your specialty, which of course is philosophy. You're a philosophy instructor and have been. Why don't you tell us a little bit actually about your background in philosophy and and your, your qualifications? Oh, do I have to talk about grad school? But yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I've been a, uh, I'm, you know, uh, I'm a literature guy first, foremost, and always, you know, I love literature and reading Ayn Rand's novels when I was a teenager, of course, got me interested in, in philosophy. And, you know, I majored in, in, in English as, in college, but I uh, studied philosophy in grad school at the graduate school of the, the, uh, of the City University of, of New York, which unfortunately is a very contemporary program. It's much, it's much more modern than it is classical. If you want, cl- interesting, if you want cl- classical approach to philosophy, unfortunately, in many cases, you have to go to the Catholic schools you know, because... <laughs> Thomas Aquinas, of course, is uh, you know the, the the philosopher of uh, Catholicism, and Thomas Aquinas was a 13th century Aristotelian. So I I, I went um, even though I was an English major in college, I went to a Catholic Catholic college, and um, I took every philosophy course they offered, and so there was a lot of a lot of uh, Thomistic influence and a lot a, a lot of Aristotle. So. Uh, I, I just happened to have here, John, by by accident, of course, it's just a coincidence. I have here a Richard McKeon's uh, basic works of Aristotle. Now, McKeon oh, was a, a was a you know famous Aristotle scholar. I think at the University of Chicago. It definitely, he was definitely American. <clears throat> and for anybody who wants to study Aristotle, this is you know must have in your in your library. I, I, like- I've I've had this copy since I was in grad school. You're going back in the 1970s, and I've moved a few times since then. But I schlepped this around with me. You know, Aristotle. Aristotle comes with me wherever wherever I go. So yeah, it looks like there's still a library sticker on the back there. It looks like you schlepped it right off the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> That's a gorgeous looking book. I have to pick that one up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Amazon. Amazon. Amazon says that, that no, I actually <laughs> bought this. I don't remember. I don't remember if I bought it at, at the Columbia University Library, um, library at bookstores, one of the major uh, bookstores in, in New York City. And yeah, yeah, this has the has the official sticker on it. But uh, Aristotle's, you 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 want to do a little bit on on his life before we before we get into his thinking. Yeah, it's funny you 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 brought up a good segue point there. You talked about uh, Ayn Rand and. Uh, she wrote of Aristotle's philosophy that it was the intellect's declaration of independence, which I think is wow. just beautiful. Yeah, yeah that uh, is that is that's a brilliant identification on Ayn Rand's part, of course, who was uh, a major 20th century Aristotelian herself, and 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 gave and gave all due credit to Aristotle as the the, the <clears throat> Ragnar Donnerschgold uh, in the. Uh, Atlas Shrugs says, you know, that that he's the oh, no, actually, actually, it's John Galt speaking, but Ragnar is the one who's going to be a professional philosopher. But but Galt says, whatever his errors, he's the, the greatest of all your philosophers. Doesn't mention him by name, but he, he referring referring to Aristotle. Yeah. And of course, Rand mentioned Aristotle by name lots of and she one of the few philosophers that she credited just left and right, really. So uh, Aristotle, born in uh, around 384. And I should just say the outset here that very little is known about his life and very little can be confirmed. So basically all of these details are, uh, are, are the best knowledge that we have. And that says that he was born around 384 BC in Stagira in Macedonia, which uh, of course is in Greece. And uh, Arthur Herman called this, I, I love this characterization, he called it the Texas of Greece. It's the <laughs> land of, of horsemen and warriors. And uh, Aristotle, you know, he wasn't a tall guy, apparently. He was so, sort of similar in stature to Socrates. But he grew up in and around the, the court of King Philip of Macedonia. 
His father was the royal physician. And uh, as we'll get to later, later in his life, Aristotle became a tutor to Alexander the Great. But uh, around 13 years old, his father died. And he, at about 17, went to Athens to study at Plato's Academy there in Athens and stayed there for about 20 years. So uh, maybe even a little bit more. Again, this is one of those things that's it's hard to pinpoint. There's a, a lot to dig into just in, in that period of his life. You know, uh, a, a lot of people, you know, we, we hear now that the battle of Western or the soul of Western civilization is a battle between uh, Plato and Aristotle. But it's also good to point out that Aristotle started as a Platonist. And according to Cicero, Cicero said that if uh, Plato's writings are silver, Aristotle's were like a river of gold. And he was referring, we take it, to Aristotle's dialogues. Aristotle wrote at first, at least, in a dialogue style, much like Plato, but only a few of these are left and, and not enough really to verify Cicero's judgment, unfortunately, on that, on that account. Right. Yeah. Cicero refers to the golden stream of Aristotle's rhetoric. Uh, and C Cicero was in a position to know, but, but you're right. We don't have the firsthand evidence to verify this. But just a, a, a few comments on what you were saying, Sean. Um, I, you, Macedonia, where, uh, where Aristotle is from, and Stagira in, in uh, particular, I, I think we could also call it the Big Sur of uh, of Greece because you know I pilgrimaged there a few years ago with uh, Greg Samieri. We were over in Greece to to nice. do a conference in Athens, and with some of the Greek Aristotelian objectivists, we we drove up to Stagira. And you, you're right; nobody knows ex somewhere in that area Aristotle was born. Nobody nobody knows exactly where, but it, it was November, so it wasn't brutally hot. Um, I, I, I don't really like the hot weather. So I was, I, you know, I was, I was fortunate there. It was November. Um, and it says, if you get anybody who's been to Big Sur, and I, I'm sure, I'm sure you've been there, John, you know how, how the, you know, the cliffs go straight down to the Pacific. Well, that's what it is in, in Stagira, except, you know, the green, you know, tree cliffs are going straight down to the Aegean. And it was a beautiful sunny day. Uh, maybe, you know, Fahrenheit, maybe, maybe it was 70 degrees, breeze blowing off the Aegean, sunshine and blue sky. And I just sat there and I communed with Aristotle's spirit, you know, it was just, <laughs> I said, thank you. You know, like uh, they, you know, they, uh, uh, you know, I, I was like in, in Atlas Shrugged. I said, thank you and well done. You know, like, <laughs> you know, you know these heroes were saying to Dagny Taggart, thank you and well done, Aristotle. That's, um, that's one, one point I want to make. But, but also, the, the court physician, his father, uh, his father, Nicomachus. Um, now, this, is the, this was the 4th century BC, maybe the 5th century BC, you know, when, when Nicomachus was, was flourishing. As how much, you know, what did it mean to be a physician back then? Uh, you know, how much was actually known about medicine? You know, that's, a, you know, relative to our day, of course, poco, right? Very little. But, you know, I always tell my students this. So some of the greatest, uh, some of the greatest medical men of the ancient world were Greeks, Hippocrates, and of course medical men. You know, still have to take the, Hipp the Hippocratic oath uh, to become become doctors. Uh, and, uh, Galen was uh, was a Latinized Greek. But the point here is that the Greeks realized that uh, disease is a is a natural phenomenon in a natural world. To be treated by natural remediation, and so that in itself was a big advance. Because when you fast forward like 800 years later, even to the, you know the early days, of the beginning of the Dark Ages, uh, even so great a mind as Saint Augustine, who was you know was a great philosopher, believed that diseases are caused by you know demons, uh, you know, and and it's uh, the disease of punishment for human sinfulness. So that disease has you know supernatural uh, origin to the, even such a great you know, to the Christians, even such a great mind as St. Augustine. It, it, centuries before that, the Greeks knew better. And so uh, that's, that's a, a point to make for us. And Aristotle grew up in a medical uh, background with a medical, uh, with medical family. And this informs his thinking uh, late, later on, his, his fascination with biology, as we shall see. 
Yeah, I think Galen said that it's it's uh, that, that school of physicians was often trained even at a very young age in dissection. So some speculate that uh, even as a young boy, Aristotle uh, was dissecting animals, but he, he was certainly introduced to a uh, an empirical approach to uh, gaining knowledge and to acting on it. Absolutely, absolutely. In, in fact. Uh, you remind me, John Herman Randall, who was a, a professor at Columbia University for, for many years and a fam famous Aristotle scholar, uh, wrote a small volume, which I just happen to have here, actually, but, you know, uh, uh, you know entitled Aristotle, surprisingly enough. And, um, you know, th there's the, the famous quote from the metaphysics. Aristotle opens the metaphysics with the quote, you know, all men by nature desire to know. <laughs> and the Professor Randall commented on this, that if Aristotle had had occasion to teach at an American university, he might change his mind. But <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, that, that was unfortunately, I think, as much true in our day than it was you know, circa uh, you know, mid 20th century, whenever you know, Professor Randall said that. But the point here is, is that Randall points out very nicely in his in his book on Aristotle that Aristotle was fascinated by facts, observable facts. He he, he was steeped in an, in an empirical approach, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in, in observation. And and uh, as, you know, as Professor Professor Randall points out, Aristotle realized that although facts in and of themselves do not constitute knowledge, we need a theory to explain those facts. Nevertheless observable facts were more certain than any, than, than any theory. And, uh, you know, I think, I think what that means that's, that's so important is that a theory must explain the facts. You don't distort the facts to fit some preconceived theory you have, right? You do this, uh, you, you do this by experience, you know, you, that is you start with the facts and the theory, the theory has to explain them. So the, you, you know, you can't warp the, you, you can't, you can't uh, try and, and, and fit, you know, you know, round facts into a square theory, you know, a, a, as it were. Theory's got to be adjusted to the facts, not vice versa. Yeah. What's that great Sherlock Holmes quote yeah. from uh, the scandal in Bohemia where he says, um, I, I don't yet have any data. And you start uh, theorizing without data, inevitably, you spin theories, uh, sorry, you, you uh, uh, bend the facts to fit the theories instead of forming theories to fit the facts. Yeah, exactly. And funny, funny, well, we're on the same page here, John, because I was, I was going to mention Sherlock Holmes in, in, in several contexts, one of which, if, if we do fictional heroes on the show, we should, we should discuss him because he's, he's such a giant of, uh, of the detective fiction, but you're absolutely right. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, that's a very Aristotelian point. And it's interesting when you, you know, you read Conan Doyle and, 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 and I'm a big Conan Doyle fan. I have been since I was, you know, 10 years old. Um, you know, the, the greatest plot writer I've ever read in, in my life is Agatha Christie. So, you know, I love her novels for, for plots, but I'm a hero guy, you know, I'm a character guy. And Sherlock Holmes, the, the character, the hero just towers over the landscape, you know? So I'm fascinated by the, the Arthur Conan Doyle uh, stories. The inter it's interesting, Conan Doyle obviously knows something about logic, but he calls what Sherlock Holmes does deduction. And yet, it's, it's what Sherlock Holmes is actually doing is he's inducing and you know, he's looking at particular details about, you know, uh, uh, that he could observe about an individual. And then he's developing the theory based on, on the, uh, uh, on the observable facts, on the particulars, moving from the particular to the general is actually inductive reasoning, which Aristotle, of course, uh, is, is uh, advocates or it's, it's, it's interesting Aristotle is famous for developing deductive logic, the syllogism. You know, but he always pointed out induction comes first. You know, if we start off, uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Okay, that, that, that argument's valid. But how do we know the first premise is true, that all men are mortal? Well, we learned that inductively, right? By observing gazillions of instances over, over thousands of years. So he always, Aristotle always famous for deductive logic, but always emphasized 
induction is, is fundamental, it's foundational, it comes first. Yeah, and I think the next phase of his life is where we really see this, at least in terms of his story. So in 347, when Plato dies, uh, people will think at least this is when Aristotle left the academy in Athens and he traveled to Lesbos uh, on the other side of, of the uh, Aegean. And uh, he set up shop there for several years. He was friends of Hermaeus, the, uh, the ruler of uh, Lesbos, or, or sorry, it was um, uh, Assos. What's today called Assos was then, I believe, Atarnius. Uh, when Hermaeus dies, uh, Aristotle moves to Lesbos, which is just the, the island uh, directly across from Assos. And he marries Pythias, Hermaeus' daughter. He meets Theophrastus. And the two uh, begin, it's believed, conducting lots of uh, surveys of geology, biology. They, they walk the beaches, they climb the hills, they uh, do various dissections and really start building a database of knowledge about really everything about the natural world. That's what they were fascinated with. Right. Right. And there's uh, several points I can uh, comment on here that, that good points that you're raising, John, is, you know, for 20 years, Aristotle, best of all knowledge, right? You're, you're right. Very little is known with any certainty uh, about Aristotle's life. It, co- it comes from the boondocks. <laughs> you, know, he's, he's, <laughs> you know, he's in Athens, a very advanced uh, culture. We, we, we have records, but, you know, Macedonia is not, not so much. But best of all knowledge... From age 17 to age 37, Aristotle remains at the academy. As long as Plato was alive, Aristotle remains at the academy, which you know, speaks of the bond between these, uh, you know, these two philosophers. Aristotle comes to disagree with Plato on philosophic fundamentals, but he never stopped respecting him as, a, you know, as, a, as an honest man and as a, as a great philosopher. According to legend, uh, Plato used to refer to Aristotle as the mind of the academy. You know, as they say, if, if Aristotle weren't there, Plato wouldn't start class. He said, wait, the mind is not here yet. Uh, <laughs> now, th- these are legends. Of, you know, maybe they're true. Maybe they're apocryphal. But, um, but that he stayed there for, as long as Plato was alive argues for the bond that he had with Plato. And that as soon as Plato dies, he leaves, argues also for that and, and something else. And the the and goes back to what we were discussing about uh, an empirical orientation, because to Plato, again, according to legend, Plato had a big sign over the front gate of the academy, his school in Athens, the sign that read, let none who are ignorant of geometry enter here. Now, there's good reasons for that. Uh, if, it's, if it's true, there's good reasons for it, because Plato wants to train his students to think, well, there's no logic yet because Aristotle is just a kid and Aristotle is the one who develops the field of logic. And so the next best thing for qualitative thinking is, is, is math and geometry. You could, you could train the mind in, 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 in quantitative rigor and then seek to carry over that kind of logic into, into qualitative questions. But the downside of this from Aristotle's standpoint, and I think and for mine and, and, and from objectivism, is uh, one, of the th- one of the reasons Plato was so enamored of mathematics is because it enabled us to rise above the empirical level, uh, you know, to rise above the, the observable level, which Plato thought was a you know, budget basement, you know, your bargain basement version of reality towards the world of forms, towards this higher world of ideas. So uh, let me use, you know, in class, I'll always use an al- algebraic example. So, you know, three times three times three X equals nine X. <laughs> Some of the students don't even get that, but sadly, but most still, most still have had enough math that they, they know that three times three X equals nine X. And so I asked them, does the truth of that equation depend upon what values we substitute for the variable X or, or, or is it invariant? And one or two of them will realize it doesn't matter. We could, we could be talking about, you know, three dollars, three eggs, three, you know, three, th- three baseballs, whatever. It, it doesn't matter. And so Plato pointed out, well, that's X is an abstraction. It's an idea. We've, we've risen above 
the the world the, the, uh, the observable world where everything's changing everything's in flux there is no permanence there is no identity there's no possibility of knowledge and uh, it's a it's a cognitive stepping stone towards a uh, higher world that's the orientation of the academy well aristotle has no interest in rising above the empirical realm he has no belief that there's a transcendent world of uh, of ideas and not surprisingly when he leaves the academy like you said he does all this biological research at uh on on lesbos and you know it's fascinating plato and aristotle to, to plato Mathematics is the paradigm subject matter. It's 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 abstract. It's it's ideas. You you know, you're not dealing nearly as much with the empirical world. For Aristotle, the paradigm science is is biology, and there is no as you pointed out, John. There is no more get your hands dirty field than biology. Do it dissections, vivisections, you know, and, you know, and stuff. <laughs> that really that cognitive the difference in cognitive uh, approach. Plato looking to rise above. You know the empirical world towards a transcendent world of permanence, and Aristotle getting his his hands is dirty. You know, up to his elbows with with dirt and blood, and you know everything. Everything about nature fascinated Aristotle. Just it's just fascinating. Yeah, Plato of course had the allegory of the cave, and he said that what we see are just shadows on the wall of the cave. We're not seeing reality. Right. If we want to see reality, we have to rise up and get out of the cave. And just as a point of contrast, Aristotle said, no, life is the cave. Life is the reality that we see before us. It's not this shadowy world of forms that Plato had, uh, had uh, postulated. Can right. you say some more on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there, there's a recent book, I don't know, five or six years ago by a, a British biology, biology professor. And he's got that French name, Armand-Marie Lois. <laughs> But he's British, L E uh, R O I. Uh, uh, Leroy, I guess, is the anglicized pronunciation, but clearly a French name. So, Professor Lois, who's a biologist, not a uh, not a philosopher, wrote a book entitled entitled The Lagoon, and it's subtitled How Aristotle Invented Science, it, which may be a little bit of uh, hyperbole, but but probably not much. And and I think Lois has done some YouTube videos on this too, if anybody wants to see that without having to, because the book is technical biology. I have it and it, go, go, it goes over my head because I'm, you know, I'm not a biologist, but, but the great uh, admiration of Aristotle's pioneering achievements in the field of biology is the reason why I, you know, I mentioned Lois' book. And we should point out that no less a biologist than Charles Darwin in the 19th century talking about uh, Cuvier and, and, and some of his the, the great, great biologists who had been his heroes, Darwin points out, he, sa he says, they were mere schoolboys compared to old Aristotle, you know, when he, when he read uh, Aristotle's work on, on animals and, and um, you know, his, his, Aristotle's groundbreaking pioneering work in, in the field of biology. Today, in the field of biology, he is recognized along with Darwin, Aristotle and Darwin, as the two great geniuses who most advanced our knowledge of the life sciences. I, I mean, it's, it's really, it's unbelievable uh, because Aristotle's reputation as a philosopher has never been in doubt since from his lifetime to ours, you know, he, uh, uh, he, he's, uh, he's an Olympian, Plato, Aristotle, Kant are the, you know, three, the th are considered the three giants in the field of philosophy. And, um, uh, Aristotle's place in, 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 in that pantheon has never has never wavered, uh, nor you know nor should it. But uh, as a scientist, his reputation has gone up and down uh, because you know for a long time physics was considered the paradigm uh, field of of science, and Aristotle made a lot of errors in the in the field of physics, which I want to say uh, we should you know is is. It's not a surprise. He's in the fourth century BC. <laughs> you know Didn't exactly. Have microscopes and uh, you know everything that we have today. Yeah, pioneers make errors. You know they're they're, they're charting new ground. So I think we should always always remember that. Uh, you know about so Aristotle's reputation as a scientist in, in the Middle Ages, high Middle Ages, it was very high. Post Newton, uh, Galileo and Newton, it was it, it, his reputation as a scientist was eclipsed. But with the rise of biology, 
you know, 19th, roughly uh, 19th century and continue, continuing to our day, you know, when the advances in biology, uh, Aristotle's reputation as a scientist has been restored in the field. He's getting, he's recognized as a great scientist, specifically in the field of biology. Yeah. And so from our understanding, he, he really kicks off his biological studies in earnest at Lesbos. He's there for several years. And in 343, he's called away to Pella in Macedonia to tutor Alexander, the son of Philip, the son of the, the man who uh, his father, Nicomachus, was physician to. And he begins tutor tutoring Alexander. And uh, Alexander, of course, a few years later becomes Alexander the Great and uh, creates one of the most massive empires in history. There's a lot of speculation about the relationship there, but what we do know is that Aristotle tutored him for at least a couple of years. Yeah, uh, you can't make this stuff up. You, you, you know, Alexander goes off and conquers the world. You know, he's getting, it's, you know truth is stranger than, than fiction. But, but before I comment on uh, Alexander, I just want to say, because you mentioned Pythias, mm -hmm. uh, his first wife. Uh, who, who tragically died very young. Um, and I, I don't remember, or even I, I don't remember if it's, if it's even known for sure, she, she might have died in childbirth. So many, so many otherwise you know, healthy young women died in, in childbirth back then. I mean, this is you know, 2,000 years before Louis Pasteur and, and the identification of you know, uh, the germ theory of disease. And, and before uh, Joseph Lister and the, the realization that sanitized conditions, you know, will, will, will save patients' lives. Uh, so very often, you know, a healthy young uh, you know, a woman or even a girl, she might be 16, 17 years old, you'll be, you'll be, be healthy. She survives pregnancy, but, you know, the physician's hands are filthy or the midwife's hands are filthy. The hovel in which, you know, she's living is filthy and she contracts some secondary infection and then, and then dies of it. You know, back then the male life expectancy was higher than the female life expectancy, for, you know, uh, I think largely for that reason. And Pythias was the love of Aristotle's life. They, they say at the end of it, he, he, he remarried years later, but they say, you know, when he, when he, in his will, he wanted to be buried next to, to Pythias, who was the, you know, the, the woman that he, that he, he loved. And, and it's so sad because, you know, Pythias dies young. Aristotle then lives the bulk of his life without the woman who was the love of his life. And Nicomachus, their son, you know, doesn't, doesn't have a mother. But uh, Aristotle does have the child of that relationship, and the Nicomachean Ethics, of course, named uh, named after both his his son and and his father. So it, it, it's touching. Um, the Aristotle scholars, you know, point out the this this, this bond that Aristotle felt uh, for Pythias. We we got in Alexander. Um, now Alexander was like thirteen. When, when Aristotle arrives in, in Macedonia. And you, you, Alexander has the great good fortune uh, to have the greatest genius in human history as his personal tutor for like, you know, a, a, year, a year and a half or, or two years. And it's, 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 a, it's an amazing story because, you know, years later, although, although Alexander and Aristotle had a falling out over, over what was it? The, uh, Aristotle thought that Alexander had mistreated his nephew, or, 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 or was, was something, something like that. Nevertheless, Alexander always held Aristotle in the highest esteem, and 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 said uh, publicly that, uh, or, or, or said anyway that uh, although Philip, you know, my biological father, although Philip gave me life, it was Philip who gave me life. It was Aristotle who taught me to live well, and and as conquerors go. For many years, Alexander was a very rational, clement uh, conqueror. He, he got uh, corrupted and went crazy. I can't even say in his old age because he was like 32 or 33 when he died. But as, as, the, as the years went by, he became more of an Eastern, you know, Asian style uh, uh, emperor dictator than he was the, the, the simple king of Macedonia b before that. But he used to, Alexander used to bring philosophers and scientists with him on his campaigns. And at night, you know, he, he didn't, he wasn't much of a drinker. He didn't, he didn't eat heavily. Uh, at night, he would delight in, you know, just talking ideas with the, with the best minds he could find, whether they were Western uh, you know, the Greeks or whether, whether they were Persians, you know, you know, Eastern, uh, Alexander had a great, 
respect for both cultures. And indeed, uh, some of his biographers think the part of the goal was to wed uh, East, Eastern, Eastern and Western culture. Yeah. Has this relationship ever been dramatized that, you know, if I can't think of, I'm not a big movie buff either, but uh, it's just such an incredible story. You, you know, of any movies that have captured this? No, I actually, actually, you, you raise a good point. Oliver Stone did that uh, Alexander movie. I don't know, 15 years ago, roughly. I don't, don't remember. Was, he's a big Alexander buff. He's also a communist, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he's a Marxist anyway, but uh, it was disappointing. I, you know, I thought he would do a better job with, uh, with the movie. And if I, if I remember correctly, you know, he has, he has Christopher Plummer. I think it was Christopher Plummer who plays Aristotle. And um you know, it's okay. He's a great actor. And he's, he's elderly, you know, so I say, it's like, he, uh, it's like Oliver Stone, you, you use the stereotype that a, a philosopher, a wise man would be, would be elderly, gray haired, you know, and everything. Whereas Aristotle was like 40 years old when he was, yeah. you know, with tutoring, you know, tutoring Alexander. He was in his prime. He, he died at age like 62. He didn't make it into his 70s. <laughs> uh, so, but anyhow, uh, to answer your question, not that I know of, and what a great book that would be to start with based on whatever knowledge we have on that relationship of Aristotle and Alexander, and then transform the book into a movie would be, would be, well, yeah, well, you're right. It'd be fascinating. Yeah. What are you Hollywood guys doing? Get on this. This is a story of, uh, of two centuries of, of 20 centuries. <laughs> well, you can, uh, and you could just do the, the, the whole line of descent, if you want, Socrates mentors Plato, Plato mentors Aristotle, Aristotle mentors Alexander, Alexander conquers the world. <laughs> you know, you can, uh, the whole line of descent is fascinating. You make a great topic for, for a book and then you, a, a long book and then for maybe even a series of movies. Oh, you remind me of a play actually called Socrates that does pretty much what you're talking about. Robert Begley reviewed it for the objective standard. I'll, I'll post it in the show notes. I haven't oh, yeah. seen it, but it sounds... Yeah, I haven't seen it either, but Robert told me it was really, really good, and I have a lot of respect for his judgment. So, uh, yeah, that's, that, that, is, that is a fascinating topic. Um, what, what else should we... I mean, we could do Alexander as a whole show because he's, you know, with caveats. I mean, he's a, he's a military... He's an imperialist, but, you know, as imperialists go, he did a lot, he, he did a lot of... Of great things, and certainly brought Greek uh, Greek culture into, you know, in, in, into the Middle East. You know, for one thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, he as as conquerors go, he was an extraordinary uh, I individual. And I don't, did he, I don't think he ever lost a battle, did he? I mean, I think every every I think he's undefeated. You know, he's like he's like the un undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. In in the movie, they they show him. Uh, uh, losing a battle in India and um, or, or getting at best a draw and his his famous battle horse uh, uh, Bucephalus that beautiful black stallion because because Alexander was a cavalry officer and uh, fearless in in a way that goes beyond courageous he was he was fearless which is crazy it's not a virtue because they're trying to kill you and you're not afraid. You, you can't value your life very much. But and so Bucephalus, you know, they're battling against these warriors in India on elephants and everything. And Bucephalus is killed uh, in battle. But that's not true. Bucephalus, Alexander won every battle in India or anywhere else. And Bucephalus uh, lived, did not die in battle. He, he, he lived to a ripe old age and died of, you know, uh, of old age. <laughs> I don't think Alexander ever lost a battle. So it's just, it's, it's just extraordinary. And they say, again, this is probably apocryphal. They say that um, at age 24, Alexander literally broke down and wept because he had no more worlds to conquer. He couldn't get his army across the Himalayas into China. <laughs> Otherwise he would have invaded China, uh, but uh, he had no more worlds to conquer. He was, he was stymied by the, you know, by the Himalayas. There's no, he had no place to go. So, Age 24, I know, you know, reading Plutarch, uh, you know, the, the, the great lives of the Greeks and the Romans, he parallels Alexander and, and Julius Caesar, and Caesar is, is, is excoriating himself, he's telling himself, at this age, Alexander conquered the world, I haven't done anything, you know, so, yeah, conquering the world by age 24, that's a, that's a high bar, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and from what I've read that on his campaigns, he would collect specimens of, of 
all sorts of animals and you'd send them back to Aristotle. I, I don't know if this is also apocryphal, but uh, apparently it, it said that, that he did this and Aristotle had all sorts of specimens on which to perform dissections and, and do other experiments. Yeah, that's a good point. I've read, I've read that too. It's, it's, a, it's a story that goes back to the classical world. Nobody knows whether or not it's true. Great story though. And it, you know, you're right. Uh, the flora and fauna in Asia, especially when Alexander was all the way in India, a long ways from Macedonia, you know, Toto, we're not in Macedonia anymore. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, he's, he's gathering, it may well have gathered, given the respect he always had for Aristotle, it may well have uh, gathered flora and fauna to send back to Aristotle at the Lyceum, because at that point, Aristotle had found his own school in Athens, the Lyceum for Aristotle to study the, 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 his fascination with all different life forms. So if that's the case, if that's true, then Alexander certainly contributed to the advancement of knowledge in the field of biology. Yeah. So in his mid forties, he was, he was tutoring Alexander and <clears throat> legend has it that around, uh, 349, 335, when he was 49 years old, uh, he, he went back to Athens and set up his Lyceum called that, I believe, because it was set up on the grounds of a, a public, uh, uh, gymnasium space like like chaos like chaos uh, however that's pronounced yeah that, and, go ahead uh, and his students uh, they conducted research on botany biology aesthetics politics history rhetoric just absolutely mind-boggling range of subjects uh, that they were really collecting all this knowledge on doing research on there's nothing like this. I mean, yeah, until you know, modern times. You know, it's interesting here, you know, even a minor point, Plato named his school the Academy, Aristotle named his school the Lyceum, uh, and they existed across town from each other. They were in competition with each other. And after the death of the, of the masters, the, 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 the schools went on specializing. You know, they taught all different subjects, like you said, but they specialized in the teachings of the, you know, of their founders. Uh, even in terms of the vocabulary, I mean, we have the English words today, academy and lyceum, meaning school in both cases, from, uh, you know, you know from, from Plato and Aristotle. And those great schools of classical antiquity survived for centuries. I think it was in, in 529 AD, uh, you know, this is like 800 years or more after Plato founded the Academy. I, I think the Lyceum had, had ended shortly before that, but the Academy was shut down by Justinian the first, the, you know, the, the Roman emperor was a Christian, you know, ruling from Constantinople uh, because he, you know, he, the, the schools of pagan philosophy and Greek philosophy were inherently subversive of Christian faith. He shut the Justinian the first shut down, uh, uh, the, the pagan schools, I, I think the academy was still in existence, and I think the Lyceum had, had faded out shortly before that, uh, and, and forbade any pagan to teach. Only, only Christians were allowed to teach. And uh, the great Will Durant, the great you know, American historian, said about that uh, after 1,100 years of, you know, uh, after 1,100 years of its great history, Greek philosophy came to an end. <laughs> You know, a Greek philosophy didn't die of its own accord. It was killed off by uh, fanatical religious faith. Sorry about that. You probably just heard my, my phone ring. Such a oh, popular we, guy. We, we still love you, John. These kinds of, <laughs> these kinds of things happen. Uh, well, you could diddle with your phone and, I, and I'll go on talking. It's why they pay me the big bucks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, <clears throat> well, one thing I think we could do several shows on Aristotle, but one thing we have to touch upon here uh, is why I think Aristotle is the greatest philosopher in human history, why I think he's the greatest genius in history, and why I think he's the greatest hero in history. Uh, and that is Aristotle preeminently, more than any other single individual, taught mankind how to think. I, 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 and and I, this is a staggering accomplishment. And what I mean by it is, 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 is two things. <clears throat> Excuse me. First of all, he uh, founds, the, founds the field of logic. He 
accredited Socrates, you know, as somebody who he, who he never knew because Socrates was executed in, in 399 BC and Aristotle was born in 384 BC. But in his all those years in Athens, he knew many people who knew Socrates preeminently Plato, but, but many others as well. And he, he was aware that Socrates sought rigorous definitions for you know, key moral philosophic terms and, and taught that to Plato, who's, you know, whose dialogues often take the form, you know, what is X? You know, in the Republic is what is justice and the youth of Fro is what is piety and the Protagoras is what is virtue. Plato following the lead of his illustrious teacher seeking you know, rigorous definitions because Socrates pointed out, you know, if, if we don't have, you know, exact definitions for these key moral philosophic terms, then we literally, we can't discuss it. We're, we're talking across purposes. We don't have, we don't have a, you know, a, uh, an objective understanding of what the, of what these terms mean. So Aristotle credits, you know, definitions are a big part of the field of logic. And Aristotle credits Socrates. Other than that, he, he says, you know, accurately, we, he said, we pretty much carved out this field you know, from, from, from scratch. You know, so he develops the field of logic, rigorous, the method of rigorous, non-contradictory thinking. So that's one point. But the second point that I think too often gets overlooked, and that you mentioned before, John, is his empirical orientation, his well, you know, what John Herman Randall you know, called his reverence for, for observable fact. Where well, Aristotle says knowledge is logical, non-contradictory reasoning about observable fact, not about myths, not about later on in history, not about faith-based beliefs, but it's you know, knowledge is gained by, you know, by uh, logical, non-contradictory thinking about observable facts. It's always about reality, not about some myth or fantasy. Aristotle wed uh, observable fact with rigorous logical thinking. And that is the method uh, to gain knowledge. That is the method of reason, of rationality, of, human, uh, of proper human cognition. And that I think is the greatest single achievement in human history that more than anything else, enable us to advance uh, our knowledge and, and promote human life. Yeah, because if you think about it, without logic, you're at a dead end in basically every other subject. I mean, you need the ability to reason to make progress in science and, and everything else. Of course, you have induction to get to the generalizations, to get to the principles. But once you have those principles, you need the ability to apply them to the concretes. And that's what logic gives us. It gives us the ability to do that without ins getting ensnared in fallacies and, and just going wrong. Yeah, so absolutely. And Aristotle identified any number of the major errors of reasoning, which he named fallacies. And you know, we still study them today. You know, I, I teach logic every semester. And it's basically Aristotle's achievement that we're, that we're studying. But and then there's the other half of it, you know, the, the reverence for observable fact that reasoning uh, doesn't gain us knowledge if we're, if we're reasoning about fantasies. And so one example of that would be from something that he would be, have been aware of in his own uh, culture, in his own day, you know, Greek mythology. One of my favorite, you read Edith Hamilton's you know, books on, on Greek mythology. One of my favorite of the myths is that, you know, Pallas Athena, who the daughter of Zeus, who Athens, you know, is the patron goddess of Athens, um, Pallas Athena springs fully developed from Zeus's head. You know, you know that, that, that must hurt, <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> but uh, she, she has no mother. And so there's, the, there's you know, there, there's the myth. It's, it's, it's a fascinating story, but yeah, obviously it's, you know, it, it, it's a myth. It's not empirically uh, accurate. And then, then you reason from that. Well, if she has only one parent, not two, then it, it makes sense that she's devoted to her father. And Zeus, who was like the uh, Bill Clinton of deities, you know, having, having relations with God knows how many females, you know, goddesses and humans, when they, when they talk about Zeus as the father of the human race, in his case, it was literal, you know, so he had, he had all these, God, how, how many different children he had, including Hercules, with God knows how many different mothers. But in all those cases, he had to share those other children with the mother. In Athena's case, he doesn't have to share her with uh, a mother, she's his. And so it makes sense uh, that he dotes on her. It makes sense that he's, he's her, her 
only parent, she, you know, she loves him. So it makes sense then in the mythology that Zeus will trust only one other person or goddess with the thunderbolt, you know, the mightiest weapon in the universe, and that's his, his daughter, Athena. Now, although that's very logical, it all makes sense coming from the, 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 the premise that, you know, that Athena has only one sure. parent. Uh, it, it's all it's all rigorously it's all rigorously logical and deductive logic, but the premise is a myth. The premise is a fantasy belief. The premise is not based in reality, and so this is not knowledge. It doesn't matter how rigorously you deduce from your fantasy premise. Uh, the result is is not knowledge. That you have to deduce rigorously from empirical fact, from observable fact. That's a key point, and. Uh, it still like, hasn't gotten through people's heads because religion uh, is makes the same error as uh, you know that mythology does. Did you, did you want to comment on this before I go on about religion? Yeah, well, I think we ought to go on uh, and just talk about the really the battle that uh, continued through and continues today, battle between Plato and Aristotle, and how that's really shaped. The Western world, and I ought to mention that Arthur Herman has a great book on this, uh, Plato versus Aristotle, but just exactly that. It's called The Cave in the Light, Plato versus Aristotle, and the Battle for the Soul of Western Civilization, and where, in which he tells the story really of how the entire thing unfolds. But I think we have just time enough to really touch on it today. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned Arthur Herman's book, The Cave in, Cave in the Light. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very good, you know, you know strongly uh, recommended. But I know we're running out of time. And I, and I think um, one more point I think we'll make about Aristotle's epistemology, about his theory of knowledge and, and how we gain knowledge. And that is to, you know, to look at religion. Because religion at its worst just, disp just rejects any, any form of logic. You know, down with logic, we just have a, you know, we're Bible thumping or Quran thumping, you know, faith-based beliefs. And if you say, if you say that, you know, uh, you, know, you know, the burning bush doesn't speak or, you know, men live, men don't live inside whales or, you know, <laughs> human beings weren't created in one day that they evolved over, you know, millions of years. If you say anything that cla clashes with the Bible or the Quran will kill you. Uh, that's religion that's worse. But at its best, religion is theology you know, which is rigorous, logical deduction about faith-based beliefs. You know, so for example, there's that, that dispute in theology. Um, does God mandate X because X is good or is X good because God mandates it? And I think the definitive argument on this uh, is, you know, God's all powerful, right? He's, he's all powerful, all knowing, all uh, benevolent creator of the universe and of, uh, of, of mankind. Well, if he's all powerful, then there can't be any constraints on his power. And it can't be that he uh, mandates X because it's good and consequently couldn't mandate otherwise. He has to do what, what's good. That, that puts constraints on God's power. And therefore, uh, X is good because God commands it, not God commands it because it's good. Now, that's a brilliant deductive argument. It's, 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 the argument is valid. You know, the, the conclusion follows from the premises, but the premise is a fantasy belief, you know, that there's this super ghost of the universe who's all powerful, all, all knowing, and, and so on. Again, that's not knowledge. Religion at its best gives us rigorous logical deduction about fantasy beliefs. They, they still, to this day, almost 2,500 years later, John, some of these great minds you know, who are very intelligent, I mean, they're you know, theologians, and they, they deduce rigorously from their religious, their faith-based premises, they still haven't gotten Aristotle's point. They, 2,500 years later, they still haven't understood. No, 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 no. Rigorous, logical, you know, non-contradictory thinking about observable fact. Don't leave out the observable fact part, you know? So uh, we're, still fighting, we're still fighting that battle, what reason or rationality is versus uh, rigorous deduction, but from fantasy premises. There's this really interesting relationship between Aristotle and religion, and you go into it in great depth in your essay, Aristotle versus Religion. For Which I just happen to have a copy of right here from the Objective oh. Standard in 2014. Oh, that's a gorgeous, gorgeous cover there. Yeah, Raphael, Raphael the School of Athens. 
Yeah. And, and in that you quoted uh, Tertullian just as one example of a theologian and his, his thoughts on Aristotle. Uh, I've got that in front of me. He said, uh, wretched Aristotle <laughs> who taught the heretics and philosophers logic. What is there in common between Athens and Jerusalem? And he correctly answers nothing. And this is just one example of, of right. the uh, rebellion against Aristotle and what Aristotle stood for. Right. And Tertullian, of course, in the name of faith-based belief, you know, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever the Bible says, you know, men live inside whales, women are turned to pillows of salt. You know, he, the, he's a fundamentalist. We, we, the, whatever the Bible says is, is literally true. But, you know, even so great a mind as Thomas Aquinas, who's a, you know, a, a brilliant philosopher, a, 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 a Christian Aristotelian, or an Aristotelian Christian, but certainly, and I have tremendous respect for Thomas Aquinas because he uh, and his teacher Albertus Magnus helped reintroduce Aristotle into in the in the uh, 12th and 13th centuries and promoted what, what they call the medieval Renaissance. And um, uh, but even Thomas Aquinas, you, you you see the Aristotelian part in his philosophizing, and he's he's a powerful logician. But the, the the religious element is there. He's he's history's greatest expert on angels. He's the biggest expert on angelology. Anything you ever want to know about angels, Thomas Aquinas reasoned it all out. You, you start with your definition of angels, and then you crank out your deductions from you know from that definition. And, and his Aristotle himself, not not one of the religious Aristotelians, but Aristotle himself, no 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 no. Just, that's not, that's all fantasy. What you know, you're wasting your mind. Power. Power on fantasy it's 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 sad it is it's very sad yeah this is one of those great ironies of history as well that the christians adopted aristotle as their own and froze his achievements at the level of dogma and uh, really gave up one half and the most important half of what aristotle taught which is look at reality look right. at the facts start there and then reason Exactly. Exactly. It's not, it shouldn't be that hard to figure out post Aristotle. Certainly it shouldn't be that hard to, to, to figure out, but evidently uh, it is. And, um, you know, you know, John, the, the speaking of Aristotle versus religion, uh, we could do a whole show on, you know, on that, on, on how, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, every one of them how to confront Aristotle, uh, uh, Aristotle's teachings and what the results of you know of that were rejecting Aristotle at the dark ages embracing Aristotle led to renaissance and golden ages a whole story in there itself that uh, that maybe we want to do a, a second show about beautiful yeah I would love to talk about the the Islamic middle uh, Islamic golden age their adoption of, of Aristotle their rejection of Aristotle and their subsequent descent into uh, basically where they are today yeah yeah, exactly. You know, you know, you, you edited and TOS published my essay, uh, Heroes and, and Villains in American Education. Um, we could do a show, Heroes and Villains in, you know, in the history of religion, because there's a lot of heroes in the Islamic Golden Age. Uh, and then in the medieval Renaissance, you know, I meant, we mentioned you know, Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas. And there's some, certainly some villains, you know, who wanted to suppress this kind of reasoning and, and burn the books and did. Uh, burn the books. So there's uh, heroes and villains. And Aristotle, the great hero standing behind the heroes of the Islamic Golden Age and the medieval Renaissance. So yeah, that, that would be a fascinating show, uh, both from the standpoint of who the heroes are, who we focus on and glorify, and then, you know, who the villains are, boo, you know, who destroyed these uh, uh, illustrious achievements and you know, by rejecting Aristotle's method. Yeah, I'd love to do that. And uh, of course, we'd love to hear from our viewers what you guys want to see. So if you've got a hero that you think we'd be interested in covering for the show, uh, drop it in the comments or shoot me an email at john at objectivestandard.org and uh, we'll consider it. Yeah, absolutely. We definitely want to hear from uh, from the viewers, suggestions on heroes or any comments on the, on the show. We appreciate it very much. And John, I hope you lead a more heroic day. I'm certainly inspired to lead a more heroic day, and I hope all of our viewers are as well. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Take care, everybody.